Matthew chapter 17, beginning verse 24, this is the word of God, for truth resides. When they, that is Jesus and the disciples, came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? He said, Peter said, yes. And when they came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? When Peter said, From strangers, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook. And take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. I'm imagining you're wondering what we're going to say about this verse. Well, let me uh, take your attention to uh, 50 years earlier in America when the preeminent Christian philosopher, thinker, Francis Schaeffer, wrote his most popular work, How Shall We Then Live? The book, which became a movie later on, argued that man himself is an inadequate basis for the, de the determining of society's norms and morals, i.e. ethics. That despite all that man thinks and knows, feels and desires, all is relative to each man and should never serve as the basis upon which to build a society. He goes on at great length through the series to point to ancient civilizations and to show how they, at some point, when they start placing their faith in man, whether it's one man, a dictator, or a Caesar, or many man, a democracy, even a republic, when they start to base their sense of the foundations of morals and ethics, that society starts going down, starts falling apart. And the reason is because they are trading out and intentionally overlooking the one great rock of every civilization, God himself. And when a society does this, the society begins to crumble. No, only God Almighty, the Christian God, Schaefer argues, is the basis of our knowledge of what to do and how to interact together. He is the sole foundation of society. Only then, when we know God, will we know how to live. And this is our problem today. Dr. Schaefer never claimed to be a prophet. But this is exactly what we're going through today. When man has taken out God, not merely from the courtroom, but from society as a whole. They, there is an eclipsing of, the replacing of God for what man thinks is true. And guess what's happening as we've taken out God of the picture? We've lost who we even are. We don't even know who we are, men or women. We don't know what we are to do with one another, how we are to act. We've lost everything. We don't know the value. There's no, we now are saying that the way for people to have value is if they do the same thing. No, our value is found in God, but society doesn't have that. And so they have to do the same thing. It's a great confusion, and we now don't know how to live. And eventually, we could uh, just become an addendum to Dr. Schaefer's book about another society that's heading down the tubes. Now, I bring this all up because what Matthew is talking about is precisely this. Consider with me. Matthew 17 started off with God, right? Jesus being transfigured and being shown as to be the great I am, the one whose radiance fills the temple. 
He is the great one. And we're called to know that the way he goes to the cross is to achieve redemption for his people. And these are exciting times. Having seen God and knowing who he is, chapter 17, beginning verse 24, and all the way through the end of 18, is talking about how now we shall then live. Knowing who God is, Jesus Christ, this is the way we live. And really, the end of 17 all the way through 18 is about how we're, it's an ethic. You look, just skim over the passage with me. How do we treat children? How do we interact with them? Verse, you know, 1 through all the way through 11. What about, what about the lost? How do we think of them? 12 through 14. Well, we seek and save the lost, right? Not one would perish. What about how do we work through problems? Well, 15 through 20 talks about that, the context of working through problems in the church. And then 21 and following. What about forgiveness? Yeah, yeah, that's really important too. Really, if you look at verse 19, sorry, chapter 19, verse 1, when Jesus had finished these words, he departed. It's not as if Matthew is structuring this whole part for us to understand a new ethic. And that's the ethic he's been building upon that makes all the more sense now knowing that he is God. This is how we are now to live. Being members of this heavenly kingdom by faith, we are now taught how we shall then live. And much of what we're going to see, even our passage today, verses 24 through 27, immediately relates to us. Those who walk by faith, and by the grace of God. These are crucial principles which teach us how we are to think and act as a result of Jesus being God. And I want to give you a little disclaimer here, because this is a tricky passage. And you probably, like I said, you probably thought, what is Pete going to say about this verse? And I'll tell you, you open a commentary like I did, or 15 like I did this past week, you'll find that they say very different things. And in the reading, you're like, well, how, do, how can we begin to make sense of this? In addition to that, this story is only recorded in Matthew's gospel. It's not in Mark or Luke or John. And usually the stories, when they're in other places, they add clarity to the passage you're reading. But we don't have that. We only have this passage. So what are we going to do? We're going to trust in the Holy Spirit <laughs> and in the study that we've had and looking at the text to understand how we shall then live. Two points this morning. The first is this, that we are to know the truth. Those who are members of the kingdom of God by faith, we are to know the truth. Look with me at verse 24. It's kind of comical. Jesus just finished talking about his life and death, right? And then guess what is always certain? The third thing is always certain. Life, death, and taxes. Well, here we go. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? What is this two drachma tax? Well, there's two possibilities. It could be the Roman tax that was placed on all those that are within their realm. Two drachma is an expensive amount. There's all kinds of estimations. It's, but it's like carrying around a couple hundred dollars with you and having to pay from your purse whenever the tax collectors see you. That's a big deal. They, the Romans did collect a tax like this. However, I don't think it's the tax placed upon the people by the Romans. I don't think it's the state tax. I think this is the temple tax for this reason, because of Jesus' conclusion in verse 26. Jesus, after hearing Peter say from strangers, that's who kings collect taxes, Jesus says then the sons are exempt. But that wouldn't work if it was a civil tax, because Jesus would then be the outsider of the Roman society, therefore he wouldn't have to pay. But because he says the sons are exempt and he pays, I draw from that, this is a temple tax. That he's exempt from paying it, being a son, but that he pays it anyway. This is the two drachma tax that we have in recorded history being collected by internally by the Jews themselves for the paying off of Passover. 
It's a big deal. It costs a lot of money. And the tithing and offering wasn't enough, so you impose tax upon the people. That's what is being talked about here. And this tax, though, there was an expectation that people would pay it. L- look with me. The question that's posed to Peter, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? When you ask a question like, did you call the police? It's an acceptable answer, too, actually, yes or no. But if you say, you called the police, didn't you? You're expecting a yes answer. This, the way this, this verse is phrased, this question is phrased, it expects a yes. There's an expectation for the teacher to pay the tax. Now, teachers in that day varied on whether they thought it was right to pay it. There were some who said yes, some who said no. But regardless of that, just like today, <laughs> there's an expectation that you pay, right? Pay up. Well, Jesus takes this opportunity in verse 25, after Peter's uh, somewhat questionable answer of yes, Jesus takes up the opportunity and capitalizes upon it to raise a greater question. He says, Peter, what do you think? Or Simon, what do you think? From whom do the kings of the earth collect taxes, customs, or poll tax? From their sons or from their strangers? What do you think? And here, Jesus is assuming the hypothetical situation of a king taxing those who are underneath him. But the question is, does he tax his own sons, his own family? No, he doesn't do that. He do- likely, he doesn't even tax those who are faithful to him, carrying out his will. More so, he taxes those who are strangers in his land. The outsiders, likely the ones he's conquered. Those are the ones that he taxes. And to that, Peter answers the question correctly. From strangers. But from there, Jesus makes the important conclusion. He says then in verse 26, then the sons are exempt. And what Jesus is saying is that God, God here is the one who is king. And what do you think? Is, does he tax his sons or strangers? And the statement is here, from he taxes the strangers. Well, here comes the difficult part. How do we do interpret this? This is where you get the vast arrange, uh, arrangement of different interpretations. Are we to think that Jesus is saying, when he says that you're exempt or free, do we think that Jesus is saying that you're free from paying taxes to the civil government? Any smiles out there? Well, I don't think so, because it's, there, it's pretty clear in Matthew 22 and three other Gospels that you are to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, Right? And there's other epistles that talk about the need to render under the taxes that are reasonably p- imposed upon us. I don't think that's the answer. I don't think Jesus is getting us out of paying our state taxes. Nor do I think that Jesus is trying to get us a, a freedom from paying our tithe and offering. <laughs> Matthew 6, Philippians 3, 2 Corinthians 9, all talk about the need and the, uh, the priority of God's people in the new covenant era to give to the Lord. So th- that's not in question either. F- ties, being free from tithes and offerings is not the issue. What then freedom is Jesus speaking about? I think this is the best conclusion, that we are free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Just like that famous Westminster Confession of Faith 20 verse it's paragraph two, God alone is the Lord of the conscience and has left it free from any doctrines or commandments of men. And as Jesus is making, is, ma- is making the truth statement that God does not tax his sons. Therefore, this tax that's being imposed upon his sons is the national people of Israel is not right. That's the true statement that he's making. That's the interpretation. But let's go on to our point. Does Jesus, at this moment, use this as an opportunity to fight? Does he press back against the need to be exempt from the taxes? Does he say that we need to reclaim lost ground because this is wrong? What does he do in verse 27? However... 
And though, even though this is true, however means, but so that we do not offend them, essentially pay the tax. The reason I don't want to go to about how we're losing ground and all these things that we need to recover our entitlements, our, the truth here at the moment, is because Jesus doesn't go there. Jesus actually isn't interested in fighting this battle. No, he simply wants, at the end of verse 26, for his disciples and followers to know the truth. He just wants them to know it, to understand it, to grasp it. And I, I think this is fascinating for at least two reasons. One, many people, because they have the right, are ready to fight. Everyone says, let's batten down the hatches. Let's get our muskets out. Shoot when we see the whites of their eyes. Let's not only have a Boston Tea Party, let's have a, a Galilean Temple Tax Party. Let's have this battle. Let's go at them. This is not right. My rights are being violated. Let's go after them. But Jesus doesn't do that at all. Jesus doesn't do a thing. He knows the truth and stops there. Could some of us learn from that? About knowing the right and then trying to fight? Could we learn something from that? I think we can. But that's at least one of the reasons. But I think there's another important reason is because Jesus is saying knowledge at many times of the truth is really enough. You need to be able to know what is right and wrong between good and evil. That's the problem we had in the beginning, right? We didn't know the difference between good and evil, and now we're learning that. That truth is coming to our hearts. And, and rather than trying to take our opponent to the mat, maybe we need to just need to step back and to understand the truth for the minute. Okay, what's true here? And here's why. Because I think this is one of our major issues today. Because there are so many who are ready to fight. So many that are ready to pick up the gun, pick up the axe, tag down and fight, fight, fight. And we haven't learned which battles to fight, which ones are really important. And we need to learn them. We need to understand. But then that is also helpful because maybe the greater problem is the world doesn't know the truth. And if you keep on fighting them, they won't know it either. Maybe we need to take a different approach, a different tactic in order to help the world understand the truth. Because the truth is what will change them. They know the knowledge of God. It'll tell them how to live. But if we are so ready to fight and don't consider our tactics and how best to engage our, quote, enemy, perhaps we've lost our way already. Knowing who God is and what Jesus does, as he did in this, in this passage, we are taught how we are to think. You've got to know the truth. Do you know it? Good. That's the truth that you know. Understand it. Process it. That's half the battle, as G.I. Joe would say, right? That's part one. But then secondly... We need to act in faith. Once we know the truth, we have to act in faith. Now, this was so connected with the first point, I almost didn't want to separate it, but I, I needed you to see the difference here. Secondly, act in faith. Verse 27. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. What's Jesus doing here? Well, it says here in the first part, he's removing the obstacle for his, quote, opponents. He says, so that we do not offend them. That word offend means obstacle or stumbling block. And Jesus is saying, I want this to be removed so that the people can 
continue to follow. They can continue to understand the way I'm going. And if we place this block in the way, and you can begin to think about how temple tax, Jesus is not paying the temple tax, what does that say about him? All kinds of things, you put that together. But Jesus says, I want to remove this stumbling block for them. I don't want them to be offended. It's at least what he does. You, you got to chew on that for those who are the, you know, the people who are ready to fight, <laughs> right? Jesus is concerned about the other people, his people who don't know the truth, his opponents. That's crucial. You got to chew on that. But what does Jesus do? Well, in verse 27, he works a miracle. And this is a whopper of a story, isn't it? Talk about a fish tale, right? All right? Go to the sea. I mean, consider all the, the chances of this happening. Go to the sea and throw in a hook. Throw in one hook out of thousands of people on the shore, right? And take the first fish that comes up, one of the hundreds of thousands of fish that are in the Sea of Galilee. And when you open its mouth, you're going to find in that fish that happened to bite a coin. It, it's, the odds here are just incredible. One to um, hundreds of millions. How does this happen? Well, our Savior did it. The one who is God. He worked a miracle. It's not easy. I mean, this is not a false story. It's a true story. What's the point of it? Why does Jesus say us, tell us to do this? And notice he wants Peter to do it. We're not told if Peter does it or not. We're assuming, we'd have to assume that he does. Jesus works a miracle, but he asks Peter to believe it and to do it. Why? Here's our second point. Because he wants us to act in faith faith. To put in plain speak what Jesus is doing, he knew the truth of the situation, whether you should pay the tax or not, but in his action, it was an action of faith meant to not unnecessarily harm someone else and requiring him not only just to go out of his way, but to go out of his way in faith. In faith. Requiring of his people to, in, in, with their engagement to, with the world, to know the truth and to act in faith. And see, really, this is what we're missing today. Yes, the world is missing truth. I get it. I'm with you in that. But you know what this world is also missing? His people acting in faith. Because we're the people that are going to show the world God is true. We're the people that are going to proclaim that our God is faithful. I mean, how is the world going to know that God is faithful unless he sees God being faithful to us and us trusting him? How, are we gonna, how is the world going to know that God is speaking unless we hear his word and respond to it? How, how, are, how is the world going to see a great God if a people is not willing to live by faith on him? What this world needs to see is a people living by faith, acting out their faith to the extent that the world says there is a God and now I know how to live. Could it be that the very need of our day is for us to walk more in faith? I think that is the answer. I think we're called to live by faith. I think that's the best truth you can drive out of this passage. I can't see anything else here. Are we acting in faith? Or, knowing the truth, are we acting out in the arm of the flesh? With our anger. With our words. With our entitlements with our, no, I'm not wrong. What if we acted in faith? What if we're a people that's not afraid of being wrong? What if we actually listen to someone and say, you know what, I've hurt you. What if we're big enough? What if we're secure in Christ enough to say to someone, I've hurt you, will you forgive me? Because that's a tough thing to do, right? Because people don't have to forgive, do they? But when a person knows that they have been forgiven in Christ and says, will you forgive me? Would you, or perhaps another thing, 
yes, I understand what's going on here, and I, I have, I'm complicit with the rest of them, and I'm sorry. When people see that, they say, that person has faith. That's what we need today. People living out their lives on the truth by faith. So I, what I want to do here is I just want to close with a remarkable story about faith. And this doesn't address every situation, but I want you to see from this story how a little girl, though she was entitled and wrongfully treated, she used it as an opportunity, knowing the truth, as an opportunity to live by faith. And you're going to hear the great action that happened, the result that followed. It's a true story about the 4th century A.D. It takes place in Russia, particularly in the people called the Iberians, a little girl named Nania and her parents went to be missionaries there. And they were praying that God would do a great work among the Iberians, make his name known. They never thought that, that prayer would be answered by the Iberians coming into their little city or little vi village, I should say, and killing the people, to include Nania's parents. They never thought of it that Nania would then become a slave to the people of the Iberians. They never thought that that would be an answer to prayer. But this is where we take up our story. Because Nania was, was a girl who believed in God. She had the faith of her father and her mother. She believed in Jesus Christ. And her ardent prayer was that the people that she was now a slave to would become Christians. And the story picks up, and one day she looked out and saw a, a mother and father carrying a little boy in their arms who was limp, who was dying. And she went to her uh, master's wife and said, well, what's going on here? And they said, well, it's, it's, it's our practice that when a child is about to die or someone they love is about to die, that you carry him to the other village, village huts to see if there could be any help given to them. And they would knock on the, the, well, they didn't have a door, the straw hut or whatever it was. Can you help? Can you help? And eventually that came to Nania's door. And she was the one who said to the my father and my mother, I can't help, but I know someone who can. So she went into her little area and she prayed and she asked God, Lord, show yourself for your own glory and help these people. In the grace of God, that child was healed on the spot. And his eyes were opened. And the parents were amazed. Now that story spread like wildfire, th wildfire excuse me, <laughs> throughout the whole village. Actually, it reached, reached all the way to the queen's ear. And the queen herself was struggling. And she said, well, I need to get this healer up here. And so she petitioned the healer to come to her, but Nania would not take it. She would go, no, no, I'm not going to go. This is not me. This is God. So eventually, the queen had to go to Nania and said, she said, the queen said, Nania, can you heal me as you healed the little boy? Nania was grieved like Paul and Peter, thinking, it's nothing about me. This is, this is God who does the work. But she nevertheless prayed again for God's name to be known. And sure enough, again, the queen was healed of her illness. Well, the story goes on. The, the king heard of it, and he was amazed. And he started hearing that the teaching of this little slave girl to his, through his wife into his ear, and he was hearing about the greatness of God, how he's invisible, but yet everywhere. He's sovereign over all things, and yet by his grace, though we deserve to die because we're sinners, he sent his son to die for us. And he would atone for our sins, and he wants to be in that relationship with us again, like back in the garden. Well, the king heard all this, but it just went out of his ears until one day, not too long after, he found himself separated from his hunting buddies, the hunting group. They were out in the forest, the deep forest with the ravenous animals in, in the midst that they were taking down and using for meat hunting. 
but he had to be separated from the group, the king himself. And a dense fog settled in upon him. And he was afraid. But at that moment, something happened in his mind. He was pricked. And he prayed, O thou whom the slave girl calls her God, if thou art mighty, show it now and help me. If thou wilt help me find my way out of this forest, my heart, my life, and my all shall be yours. And he opened his eyes, and the fog was gone. And he found the hunting party again, and he was home. That king was true to his word because the very next day he was at the feet of the little slave girl saying, I want to know your God. Tell me about him. What happened there? It was one little girl who acted in faith And rather than bringing about her entitlements and rights and trying to hurt other people and saying this is wrong, she, in the mercy of God, acted in faith. And God did a wondrous work. The kingdom became Christian. I wonder what would happen in our day if people started acting in faith. Just nobody's like you and me started living out our lives by faith and saying, you know what, Lord, there's a lot going on here, but you're calling me to live by faith. You're calling me in my sphere, at my workplace, in my home, in my neighborhood, in the civil realm. You're acting me, you're asking me to act by faith, to live out the promises of God and not to be shy and scared of faith. I'm not saying truth, I'm saying faith. We're not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And that's what this world needs today. It needs a people who are living out that faith in their lives. We know who God is. We know the truth. And we need to act out that truth by faith. That's exactly what we need in our day. A people knowing God who know how then to live. You hear me, church? Let's pray together.